So Mary, Mary Jo, welcome again to this uh, session uh, on translation. As a poet and translator, what brought you transla to translation in the first place? Oh, Matthias, what a big question. Um, I was interested in translation for a long time. Um, after taking a class, in um, translation, a workshop at Columbia University when I was working on my MFA. And that was in the late 90s, no, mid 90s, really. And after that, I read translations with much more knowledge and appreciation that there was something added by the translator. There was um, that no, true, no two translations would be alike. And I think that naively before that, I was like a lot of people just thinking that you plug in one word for another and that most people would come up with the same word. So um, taking that workshop and it was with uh, William Weaver, who was the great translator from Italian of Uberto Eco and many other Italian writers, um, really sensitized me, I think, to um the 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 creative aspect of translation and it wasn't until um 2005 that i actually went back to translation and began translating really just the first three lines of dante's inferno william weaver who was my colleague at bard college and i really appreciated his energy and his humor and his operatic persona uh, and he was a translator of opera texts as well opera libretti um, so in opera the voice is the most important part of the play of the game um, what's your take on voice and what was so attractive for you to kind of like voicing dante's uh, universe well i went about it um in a uh a way to lower the register of the voice compared to previous translations. I had always found that the translations of the Inferno, um, and at that point I wasn't really that aware of uh, Purgatorio and Paradiso, but they were always pitched at this high level and it appeared to be a way to gesture to the fact that the poem had been written in the 1300s. But of course, the English that was chosen wasn't the English of 1300s. It was more or less the English of, you know, maybe the 1800s, thou and canst, and um, sometimes even maintaining the Italian word order as, I guess, a gesture of homage, because it really didn't make sense to me that you would use the Italian word order in English, which is um, quite different. So um, I wanted to make a translation that sounded more contemporary. And I wasn't aware that anyone had done that before. So I was kind of starting out from anew in terms of where to pitch the voice and how I might maintain the, the true spirit of the Inferno but at the same time, making it more readable, which is really what I wanted to do. And um, so I had that very specific idea in mind. The form uh, of the three books of Dante's uh, masterpiece is kind of like, I think, pretty stable in, in a way. Uh, one of your strategies in translating um, those uh, wonderful books uh, is also to uh, to put in contemporary references to kind of like deep uh, dig deep into um, pop culture songs to play with lines which for an American uh, reader might be really interesting and it will bring a smile to our faces. Uh, that's a very bold strategy. Uh, how did you come by that? Well, I wanted 
first of all, I wanted people to be able to read it, but then I wanted people to want to read it. And those are two different things. Like if you're committed to reading something, you know, you pick it up and you want to be able to read it with some fluency. But many people are intimidated by a book written so long ago and something that is seen as being, you know, kind of the high poetical and um, the serious text from the past. And, and those elevated um, translations, I think, actually cooperate with that sense. But I wanted people to see the humor in it. I wanted people to see that the hell of today is very like the hell of, of you know, 1300s. And so my idea was to occasionally, but not too often, to insert, and again, when it met the translation exactly or very close, something of the, the current era. And, um, you know, one of the examples was to put Eric Cartman, the character from South Park, into the um, the level of hell committed um, for the the gluttonous, and of course, when I went to think, well, who's the quintessential glutton of today? And that was, of course, you know, now almost twenty years ago because it was um, two thousand five. And I was a big fan of South Park. And if if you are, you'll know that Eric Cartman likes to eat a stack of pancakes with powdered sugar donuts on top. And he is a glutton. And so he, he popped to mind. And so I thought, why not? And particularly because in Dante, that character is not linked to any historical person, but seems to be that kind of person we all will see ourselves in because who hasn't been a glutton of some sort at some point. So um, the name that Dante gives that character is Piggy. And coincidentally, there is a point in um, South Park where Eric Hartman is called Little Piggy, both by his ophthalmologist and by um, a peer who he has tricked. And that peer makes him sing a little song, I'm a little piggy, oink, oink, oink. So the fact is that Eric Cartman has the nickname Piggy, and Dante gave this character the nickname Piggy, or Pig. Um, and so it was a perfect fit with the translation. And that was always my aim, to try to make that perfect fit so that it truly is translation, but that the mirror held up to the reader is one in which they see themselves today instead of feeling like this is some quaint literary artifact where they're reading about, you know, things that happened in the past. So translation is a form of bringing works from different time spans and different cultures into the space of American culture, in your case, American language, American literature, and make them contemporary. Is that kind of like what, what your stance would be as a translator and as a poet? Certainly with Dante's Inferno um, and Purgatorio and now Paradiso, which I'm um, just finishing up. So that, that, my decision to do that was based on that particular text and the fact that we already have many, um, you know, previous translations that might adhere more closely word for word to the original. And as I said before, sometimes they adhere too closely because it is a poem. And the translators, often scholars, don't prioritize that. They prioritize that historical sense and I think that if you're translating a poem, you have to make it a poem. And there are many elements, as you know, you're a poet. The, the expressive use of sound is one of them. Um, you know, and particularly with Dante who used terza rima, that interlocking rhyme scheme. So rhyme is dominant. And I'm not able to use rhyme in that case because as you know, 
English is a very rhyme poor language compared to Italian or any Romance language. So I'm substituting alliteration, assonance, rhyme, um, internal rhyme, occasional end rhyme for Dante's very loud, in a way, um, pattern that is, um, you know, well, I don't want to go into terza rima, but it's um, it's it's a very um, musical and rhyme because it keeps interlocking with the next three lines. So, um, but your question was, is that my approach as a translator? That was my approach as a translator of the Divine Comedy, but I don't know that that's the trans my general approach to translation. I'm I'm really a very um, I, I'm I'm really committed to maintaining the relationship between the original and the translation. But again, if it's a poem, I think there are it's a juggling act where sometimes you're elevating the need to have sound and then other times you're elevating the need to have readability, um, you know, accessibility, and some things don't translate. You know, there are idioms, there are jokes, there are puns that are, that can't be replicated in the the original word that's being used. Since I had the pleasure to also work with you directly on the book of mine, uh, my first collection of poems, Loops, uh, which uh, you translated uh, really geniusly into English, and you changed the title of the collection because Loops is one of those puns which works in the German language quite well because it's an imported English word with a double O, you know, as if the word is looking at you. Uh, and it's connected to all my other uh, poetry titles, uh, Pools, uh, Tools, and Spools, which are also kind of like immigre expressions from English uh, to certain uh, it's in certain times. Uh, you selected a title uh, stemming from one of the poems in the collection, Colonies of Paradise. Um, how important was that change of title? And how, how did this decision to kind of like make this a title also maybe inform your translation or your last version of the translation of my poems? Well, I think it goes back to what I said before, wanting to make a reader want to read the book, which is no small thing. People often have a resistance to poems. They, they think that they don't understand them or that they're trivial compared to nonfiction, you know, the front page of the New York Times. There's an urgency. So you want to lure the reader to the the work. And as an English title, Loops, I felt didn't really give the reader access to what they were going to encounter and perhaps wouldn't have a sense of suspense. Whereas Colonies of Paradise, I mean, who doesn't want to know about paradise? And particularly the oddity of colonies, because a colony is outside of something. You know, it comes from the Roman word, which was devised to describe those farmlands outside the main city, often worked by people who were, you know, taken over by the, the armies, but or sometimes the armies themselves. But they were feeders into the, you know, the main city like Rome. And so that idea of what it would a colony of paradise look like and opposed to being in paradise, what's the difference, you know, the, the lesser standing of a colony of paradise. So I felt like it was an exciting title. It was the title of one of your poems. And the fact is that as we talked while we were doing the translations, working on them together very closely, that these four different cities that um, you know divide the the book into four sections: Chicago, Paris, um, Moscow, and um, Hamburg. I believe the is Hamburg, right? The German city. Yeah. So those are. Um, places where the speaker of all the poems 
is um, trying to find a paradise, but can only find a colony of it and goes from one place to another looking and searching to be part of something really. And so it's that outsider's perspective, which you could think of as being someone who's in a colony. And so that it seemed quite perfect in the description of what was going to be inside the book, as well as a, a kind of teaser like, come and see what a colony of paradise might look like. Come and see, that sounds like a Johnny Cash line, and I think it is, uh, and a uh, wonderful uh, point. Uh, in one of the poems uh, which we worked on, uh, and where, where we also had a long discussion of, about the title, it's from the Moscow series set in Moscow uh, in the Red series. Uh, the title in the German was Malakor, which is the Russian word for milk. Uh, which kind of like pops in and out of the whole series. Uh, anyways, uh, it's uh, it's a word uh, which for English readers will not be decipherable uh, unless they are huge fans of Anthony Burgess' uh, seminal novel Clockwork Orange, where they have a Karova milk bar, where milk is also once mentioned as Malako. Um, and uh, you came up with the brilliant idea very late in our translation process uh, to call this poem Russian milk. I think it was one of those uh, moments. Um, so, and this, this I think uh, shows also uh, some of the joy you as a translator, as a poet and translator have to kind of like add to, to words. And by adding, I mean, uh, through this, instabilize uh, meaning making as we see this as a traditional way of translators, because everybody could say like, oh, why is a Russian word in a German poem then translated uh, as two words in an English poem, Russian milk? Uh, but I kind of like this destabilization act, you know, by call it Russian milk. What's so Russian about milk? Because it's drunk in Russia, because it's produced in Russia, because it's sold in Russia. Um, also another trait, which I, I realized is uh, that you really try uh, to kind of like layer meanings through uh, additional adjectives or adverbs to kind of like make the lines murkier, to kind of like have more access points for the reader. Um, what does it give you back as a poet to work as a translator so intensively with texts? Well, for me, it's a game. And for me, poetry is a game, which is not to say it's not a very serious game, but it's a word game. And with the uh, example that you just gave of the Russian milk, that actually is a more, um, it's a more literal translation of the word than anything else I had been able to come up with because the word that you had was the Russian word for milk. So I guess the only more literal would be to title it the Russian word for milk. So we've only taken out word for because it would be reductive to say this is a word um, or a word for in a book of translation. So that Russian milk does several things. It um, fits with the poems in that section. They're from Russia, the speakers in Russia. It solves for the problem of what to do with this Russian word, that if we left it, very few people would have access to it because we have very few, relatively speaking, Russian speakers in um, among our poetry readers in America. So I'm always trying to find the solution and a solution that has some kind of, really, I guess you'd say elegance, so not to belabor something more than it's belabored in the original, but a way, I, I really think of it as kind of a crossword puzzle, that if you find the right word, everything around it falls into place. And sometimes if you're a crossword puzzle worker, you'll know that if you find one word, it fits the right number of spaces, you start you know, and sometimes you can even get a second word that um, interlinks with that, but then you get stuck because it's not the right word. And it's only when then you revisit it and you find the right word, everything else around it falls into place. 
I think that translation is exactly like that. You're trying to find that word that not only works for that thing, which in my example, that word might be a synonym and fit those number of squares, but also with which everything around it will fit into place, will fall into place so that all the different meanings are present and yet the reader isn't stumbling over um, the the text in a way that might, you know, undermine their pleasure of reading. So I'm always looking for that, that solution to how to say this, how to make it fit with the original, the same number of squares, how to make it fit with everything around it. And often, you know, there are jokes and puns in crossword puzzles, as well as in poetry. And your work has a lot of humor that's embedded in the language. So it's not a broad kind of humor that is available on the surface, but it's only when you read carefully and you see what language is doing, then you appreciate the, the poetic intelligence and the psychological richness. So those things go hand in hand. A poet who is aware of how language works will be able to, to do that in a way that um, other people can't do. And that's part of the pleasure of being a poetry reader is encountering that exact kind of dynamic where someone has embedded not only meaning and multiple meanings, but also levels of psychological richness. And you do that, which of course for a translator makes it even more difficult, but more satisfying when you're able to find a solution to uh, something like that title. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. You, you packed so much into those uh, remarks uh, from poetry uh, to translation. Uh, you are a, a translated poet yourself into many languages. The Spanish translation was extremely successful. Uh, the German translation, which was done by Uda Strittling and myself, was very successful. Uh, so many more uh, coming out as well. Uh, how does that change your perception of your own work once it's translated? Um, once it's translated, well, when it's translated into a language that I don't know and have no access to, I, I can't tell what the translator has done. I remember um, reading in Germany and this was a book um, that had been put together, a, a kind of anthology book, a selected poems prior to the book that you and Uda had translated. And after the reading, someone came up to me and said, how does it feel hearing your language read in German, which sounds so different from the original English? And I said, I, I, I don't know, because I, I mean, I don't have an opinion, when I'm listening, I'm always listening for that occasional word that I do recognize so that I'll know where in the poem um, I am. And then I can try to match the language, but without that, I'm totally lost. So one of the moments in that particular setting was um, there's a, a moment in the poem where something goes bam, which is, of course, that comic book, um, you know, substitution for sound. And um, it's always accompanied with an exclamation point. And so of course the German sounded bam and I knew exactly where we were. And I'm amused by that, but outside of that, I can't know. I can't know what's being said. I mean, I could type you know, the translation into my computer or ask for a PDF of it and then put it in Google Translate. But even so, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in somebody who doesn't speak English interacting with the translation. But again, that's outside of my experience. And so I can't know anything about that. Uh, when we uh, put our book together, the, my poems in your translation, 
uh, for our American publisher, uh, we had a decision to make, uh, which was either to have it bilingual on two uh, pages side by side or to have only the English version. Uh, the third version that they suggested to us, we dismissed right away. Um, what was, I mean, we were both very clear of what we wanted. What is the, uh, it's it's always for poetry translators, I think a decision to make. I mean, not a lot of publishers are offering even uh, the, the accessibility of the original side by side to the English, but uh, we both had a very clear opinion on why we only wanted to have the English. Could you maybe also talk a little bit about that? So you're talking about my translation of your poems, right? Yes. 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 In that case, with your cooperation, I made some decisions in the translation to prioritize that layering of meaning that we just talked about. And if you compared that to the original German, if a German speaker compared it, they might feel frustrated um, in terms of the um, rigor. And they might say, well, she's chosen this word, I don't know, uh, tree, and it's really bush in uh, in the German. But, you know, you and I would argue they're in the same family, whether something is a bush or a shrub um, or a tree. And so if I'm choosing tree because there's a long E coming up in that line, you know, my feet in the tree, um, I don't want someone or we didn't want someone to, you know, stand by with a finger going tisk, 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 you know, you shouldn't have done that. And because I was able to work with you, I think if, if you know, if you were no longer on earth um, and I didn't have access to that permission, I might not have made that same decision. But I think that there was um, the ability to cooperate with each other and to talk about how to get at the meaning using language in another, you know, in, in another, um, using another language, um, how to get at the essential meaning, how to play with sound, how to, um, have that psychological richness that I talked about before, that depth, which your poems have. And, and it is so balanced with humor that you really, sometimes I felt had to indulge in a little bit of, you know, twisting and twerking. And again, because you were there and could look at my choices, and time and time again, we, we spent years doing this where I would show you a possible solution and you would say, you know, that's really close. Um, in fact, that's fine. And, and I would come back and say, no, 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 I don't want to be close. Tell me what, tell me how I might get closer. And, you know, what have I left out or what have I put in that isn't there? And then we'd have a, a discussion that would allow me to go back and, you know, using a dictionary to get closer. And then I would come back to you and, you know, you would say, oh yes, that's really great. It's almost perfect. It's like, wait, almost perfect. I want perfect. And you say, well, the only thing is, you know, this little thing, like, you know, the car was speeding instead of just driving. It's like, okay, I can fix that. And then as I would so-called fix it, I would come up with something that I thought was even better than just speeding in terms of creating that visual image. And the visual is so important in poetry. And that's why image is, you know, the, the bedrock of poetry, because the reader needs to see an alternate universe. And otherwise it's just abstraction after abstraction. And so you know, you want to create that sense of the car speeding down the highway. So whatever I came up with, and since that's a hypothetical example, it wouldn't matter. Um, but then, you know, once I would come back to you and you would say, that's exactly, exactly what I wanted the reader to see. Now, if one looked at the German, however, it was just speeding. 
And so you could argue that I've added something, but I've added it in the service of making the poem work exactly as it did in German. And that's what I want to do as a translator, to make the translated work operate in the same way that the original operated and within limits in terms of going outside of the original language. And I think as I've gotten better and better as a translator, I'm more and more able to stay within the lines and still achieve what I want to achieve, which is not to say that I don't sometimes have to push you know, against a line, but I get better and better. And I, I imagine you would say the same thing because you're a translator as well. I would, and that was perfect, Mary Jo. Thank you so much. Maybe uh, just like the last little example from Paradiso, and uh, then we are done. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, you asked me to come up with an example of a translation problem, and it's going to sound simple, but it hasn't been simple in my mind. And it concerns the very first line of the first canto of Paradiso. In the original, the literal is, um, it, the literal uses the word for move. And the original translation says, the glory of the one who moves everything. Well, when I was first translating, and you know, this was some years ago now, first translating that line, I felt like it sounded flat. So the one that moves everything, you know, and I thought, how can I stay within the lines, but make that sound more active? And I came up with the word animate, which means to move something. And when you think about the, the Godhead, that's what they did in the beginning, right? They animated everything. And I even had the, the vision of the Disney, the old Disney with the, um, you know, the wizard who... Uh, starts animating everything, and he himself is an animation, and of course everything gets out of control, and then there's all this water, and the seas flood um, the um, the poor little character. So I used animated, and I stayed with that for you know three years, until well four years really, until I got to the end of um, Paradiso. And the last three lines, I don't want to spoil anything here, so I'm not going to tell you exactly what the last three lines of Paradiso say, but it uses the same verb, to move. And the speaker says that things were moving like, um, you know, a, an even, a wheel going around evenly. And that image is so key to the experience of the entire divine comedy. The speaker gets to that place, turned toward God, the all mover, and things are moving and they're caught up with it. And there's this peace and calm and totality. And suddenly I realized I can't have that word animate in the first because animation or the, the the wheel is animated smoothly makes absolutely no sense. And so I had to give up that moment, which I loved so much um, in that first line in order to reconcile Dante's plan, which is that, you know, he first mentions God in the first line of Paradiso and now is one with God at the end and all moving and now all is moving, including the character Dante, who we know, you know, begins Inferno being lost in a dark wood. So um, there are moments like that where, you know, you keep solving something and you think, yes, I've solved it. This is perfect. And then an entire book later, you see that it's not perfect. Um, because there's a divine plan, and that plan, in this case, is Dante's, and you have to cooperate with that plan, because you want to, you want to be, you know, that person who 
is able to bring Dante's poem into the present and only um, in that way will you do it properly. So the task of the translator becomes being the best reader of the original plan of the poet. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. That was a very wonderfully intense talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking me and thank everybody at um, Versopolis.